Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We will be starting in a minute. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Mwango Kapalaula. Before we begin, here's a little bit about MIC and the Global Food Security Cluster Cash and Market Working Group. The Markets in Crisis was officially created in February 2014. The MIC Community of Practice provides a platform for various actors engaging with markets in emergency and development contexts to discuss ideas and experiences, share resources and learning, and foster greater collaboration to improve market-based programming and practice. MIC aims to facilitate links between those whose work focuses on crisis responses and those who are more concerned with longer-term market functioning and development. The MIC platform offers a variety of ways for community members to engage through online webinars such as this one. The Global Food Security Cluster Cash and Market Working uh, Group is co-chaired by USAID and CRS and exists to facilitate and support the mainstreaming of cash and voucher assistance and other market-based approaches in food and security uh, sector. It has been operational since 2013 and works alongside with other clusters and any inter-cluster cash working groups as well as CALP to share learning relevant products and experiences, as well as find ways to integrate assistance when, uh, when multi-purpose or multi-sector cash or voucher assistance is preferred um, modality for food security programming. Damien Jod from Global Food Security Cluster will be handling our Q&A session and closing off today's webinar. A few logistical things before we begin. Um, if you have questions for the speakers at any time during today's webinar, please enter them in the Q&A box appearing at the bottom of your screen as opposed to the chat box. We have added a new function where you are able to upvote questions if someone has already asked a question that you're in also interested in. This webinar will be recorded. You'll receive the event recording and presentation via email over the next couple of days. Please be informed that this webinar is one hour, 15 minutes, and we will end at 1.15 GMT. Finally, I would like to pass on to Corey to share more about the webinar and introduce today's speakers. Thanks, Wango. Um, and uh, thank you for that introduction of the Markets and Crisis Discussion Group, as well as the Global Food Security Cluster Cash Market Working Group. Uh, just to give a bit of a plug, that if you're not involved in the markets in crisis, or as we call it, the MIC discussion group, um, we'll pop the link in the chat, but please do get involved. Um, we're always welcoming new people. And similarly, if your agency is a food security cluster partner, uh, we're always keen to have more people involved in the cash and market working group at the cluster level. So um, these are two active fora, and it's great to be combining today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Corey Sissons. I'm a cash and markets advisor with Catholic Belief Services, and we co-chair the cash and market working group at the Global Food Security Cluster, and I'm also involved in the MIC group. And it's my job to briefly frame the topic today, which is a real-time learning discussion on market-based programming and liquidity crises. And the catalyst for choosing this topic was really seeing the ongoing situation developing in Afghanistan at the moment. Um, I think we mentioned this on the invite, but many of us 
um, have worked in or are aware of contexts where access to physical cash can become a real challenge as a result potentially of um, political or an economic situation. And Afghanistan at the moment really appears to be no exception. And as we saw questions about this come up in the MIC discussion group, some of us started to say, you know, ah, well, this worked in this context. And I remember we did this and that might help the, the colleagues in Afghanistan with what they're seeing. So we began to think maybe it was a good idea as this situation in Afghanistan continues to unfold that we bring together colleagues from other contexts to see if we can share lessons learned, understand maybe what blocked and enabled successful market-based uh, responses, all with the aim that we can hopefully encourage people that it really is possible to, success to successfully implement market-based programming in such environments. And so it's my pleasure to introduce our wonderful speakers for today. Um, so we have from the WFP Zimbabwe, we have Nontanzazo Musengezi, who is a program associate in the cash-based transfers team. And we also have uh, the VAM officer, Modin Butamocho. And they're going to be sharing about the Zimbabwe context, about adaptive programming in recent years in relation to cash shortages, as well as the role of market monitoring in supporting programmatic decisions. Uh, we also have joining us today uh, from CashCap, uh, Faye Kergahastian, who has been the Cash and Markets Advisor for the whole of Syria response since 2018. And she's been involved in seeking creative solutions uh, in the Syria context as the combination of counter-terrorist financing legislation and international sanctions has made it very difficult for humanitarian agencies to move and access funds. Uh, we also are lucky to have George Bitti, who is currently chairing the cash working group in Kabul, where, as many people are aware, following the Taliban takeover, we have seen billions in central bank assets frozen, international financial institutions suspending access to funds. And so even though humanitarian aid has continued, George will be sharing with us some of his perspectives on the current challenges and that situation. And finally, uh, we thought it was really important to have the donor perspective. So from that side, we have Isabel Pelly, who is ECHO's global thematic expert on cash and basic needs uh, based in Nairobi. And she currently co-chairs the Global Donor Cash Forum, uh, through which she's led the, led the development of the Good Practice Review on cash assistance in contexts of inflation and depreciation. And she'll be providing a donor perspective on some of these challenges. Um, following this, uh, my fellow uh, colleague from the Markets in Crisis Advisory Committee, Louisa Seferis, will then be leading a discussion between these speakers on some critical questions before handing over to Damien from the cluster for a general Q&A. Uh, so thank you for tuning in today. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Numta and Molin to speak to us about Zimbabwe. Over to you. Um, thank you very much. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, so I'm just going to dig right into it and I'm going to start by giving us an overview of the landscape that um, we are currently operating in in Zimbabwe. Um, as some of you might know, uh, Zimbabwe is a fairly young country, um, attained independence in 1980, at which point the Zimbabwean dollar was introduced at part to the US dollar. Fast forward um, a few years later, in 2000, Zimbabwe was plunged into an economic crisis. And this was triggered by three major events. Number one, uh, the country went into the Congo war, uh, which essentially uh, put pressure on the financial, um, on the five country's finance. Uh, additionally, there was an unplanned public spending um, when uh, the uh, Liberation War uh, veterans um, wanted pensions. And so the government went out and paid them. Um, and then there was also the accelerated land reform program. And this really put pressure on the, on the economy. Um, essentially what then that triggered is it triggered a hyperinflationary environment. Um, as some of you might know, we had uh, inflation rates upwards of eight to nine, six trillion um, at, 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 uh, by the time we reached uh, 2008. Um, at this point, post this, a new government got in, 
in, uh, into power. Uh, it was a government of what we call national unity. And during this period, the US dollar was introduced. And, um, you know, we, 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 we sort of enjoyed some economic stability between then and around 2016. Um, what happened in 2016 um, is that government now uh, had huge public deficit and they then financed this by issuing treasury bills. And um, additionally, Zimbabwe had become at this point more of a consumer market and we had a net trade um, with a net trade, a trade deficit. So we were importing more uh, than we were exporting. And so you find that in terms of foreign currency, our foreign currency reserves were depleted significantly. And this then triggered the second cash crisis. And this is the one that we're going to be focusing on in this discussion in um, 2000 and in 2000 and between 2016, 2018. Um, what then happened also is, so, you know, people went into the banks and there was no cash. And at this point, as I might say, we were using mostly the US dollar, but it was a multi-currency environment. And so a shortage of foreign currency essentially meant that people did not have the money that they required for them to be able to purchase the goods and commodities that, that they required. And Zimbabwe is a cash economy. And so the, the, the not having enough cash really then um, had some significant um, uh, on, the, on the people. And then, um, so in June 2019, the Zimbabwean government announced the reintroduction of the, RTG, of the Zimbabwean dollar through what they called um, RTGS dollar and um, banned all use of foreign currency. So no foreign currency was no longer legal tender. And by, by mid-July 2019, inflation had rose to around 175%, uh, sparking concerns that the country was entering into another hyperinflation in, upper inflationary environment. And that did happen because by the time we reached July 2020, we had reached an inflation rate of 737%. And um, like I said, you know, we had, we were in the cash, we didn't have cash in the banks. And so this was really, um, this was really, um, of concern. Um, so there were cash limits for both local and foreign currency. And at this point as WFP, we did have cash programs, but my colleague Nomta is going to then dwell into how that then affected our operations. Um, what I'll focus on now is what we, so I am from a technical background and essentially what we then did um, was what happened is now there was an exchange rate between the US dollar and the Zimbabwean dollar. But the Zimbabwean dollar took, um, let's just say two major forms. There was the cash and there was what we call mobile money. So uh, there was a different exchange rate if you're using actual bond cash and there was a different cash uh, exchange rate if you're using mobile money. And this changed daily. And the strategies of foreign currency in the banking system this fueled demand on the black market, which offered higher rates compared to those on the official market. Um, traders, access to foreign currency on the official market was limited, hence uh, it sourced from the black market resulting in prices being pegged using the US, um, using the black market rate. Um, so what we then did is this triggered us to have, um, to conduct market assessments so we conducted a market assessment at the start of the crisis. This is in 2016. This was a comprehensive market analysis where we tried to understand the market functionality um, in all the districts, rural districts in Zimbabwe. And so this then also informed the um, modality of transfer for each of the districts that we were working in. 
Um, additionally, we then had another one in 20, 2018 um, when the crisis had deepened just to see if anything had changed. Because at this point, prices were increasing significantly on the market. And so we had the second market assessment. We also had another one post introduction of the of the, of, of the Zimbabwean dollar. We had another market assessment just to try and see the impact that this had had on the local markets. We then, um, and like I said, you know, there was a time in 2018, we had reached a point where uh, the rates were changing on a day-to-day -day basis and we had cash programs that were running. Um, and so what we then did, because now the value today because now we're paying them in, um, we're paying beneficiaries in the local currency. Um, but what was happening is prices, local local currency prices were significantly changing. We're significant, sorry, we're changing rapidly. And so what we had to do is, um, as VAM, uh, we played a crucial role through the calculation of the food basket. So we projected the value of the basket in local currency for each cycle, at least a month before distributions through models that took into account trends, including behavioral, economic and market outlook. So we looked at availability trends, trade, so how much was coming into the country, the cost of living. And having done this, we also included a buffer for changes outside of the sphere of our analysis. This allowed us to come, um, to come up with, a good, with good estimates that ensured beneficiaries received enough to purchase the food basket. Um, so I will end here and I'll hand over to my colleague, Nomta. Over to you, Nomta. Thank you, Molin, uh, and the good afternoon, colleagues. So, uh, in essence, uh, the Zimbabwe country office uh, up to 2016, uh, the cash-based transfers that we were uh, that we were implementing as a as a country were through NGO partners, uh, and these NGO partners had their own contracts with their security. Uh, with the, the service providers, the security companies to distribute the cash through the uh, CIT. So WFP was uh, then reliant on, um, on those uh, FSP and the NGO partners in as far as the, the CBT uh, and the disbursements were, co were, were concerned. And this uh, provided um, uh, some challenges in that um, uh, as we proceeded through 2016, the NGO started uh, facing challenges of getting the US dollars in cash uh, from the respective banks. With that in mind, uh, the country office uh, was then sought to increase our CBT operations in 2016, uh, 2017, and uh, this uh, meant that uh, we had to take more control of the operations and WFP started working on our own contracts with the FSP where we had direct control uh, of the contracts for CIT as well as uh, mobile money. Um, and with this, the country office made a, a decision to ensure that all beneficiaries were registered in SCOP so that it will be easy to, 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 to implement what the scope is the WFP platform for beneficiary management. So uh, given that the country office uh, made decisions to pilot uh, the scope e-voucher, which was uh, piloted at that time. And also uh, we volunteered to pilot another e-voucher, which was a, a net one through the net one platform by a South African company. Uh, so the piloting of this meant that uh, we learned lessons on the implementation of those so that when we are scaling up, then we'll be doing it from an informed decision. And then uh, in the same token, uh, WFP uh, engaged with, um, uh, engaged with, um, with the government to ensure that I would be given preference in terms of uh, US dollars from the banks. 
and this saw us uh, picking up to distributing about 2.4 million per month um, within that uh, uh, lean season assistance. So within this uh, operational environment, we had um, uh, challenges that uh, we faced as a country office um, in that the, the mobile money, for example, that we were implementing was uh, rather costly. Um, and the agents were also frequently running out of the cash. And the three-tier pricing system that uh, Molin has already mentioned was also uh, one of the challenges we uh, encountered. And then also um, some of the retailers uh, and the agents were taking uh, advantage of the situation and uh, overcharging. Um, so the turning point for us was um, in June 2019, where government introduced the SI-142, which um, recognized the, the ZIM dollar as the official uh, uh, exchange rate. Um, with that, we were forced to move back to uh, ZIM dollars, uh, which also presented challenges in that the, the ZIM dollars were not available and it became very difficult to implement the, um, the, the CBT. Uh, added to that were the, 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 the calculations of the transfer values which were done by our VAM team on a monthly basis. So the lessons learned from uh, all these uh, operational um, operations was that um, it was uh, prudent for WFP to have contracts in place with uh, the different uh, FSPs, uh, financial service providers for flexibility between modalities that is mobile money, CIT and remittance based, as well as the use of long-term agreements. Uh, for example, uh, with the Western Union, these are at um, a global level and you are able to involve them at a short notice um, in order to use uh, as a country office. Um, and then the piloting also assisted us in that uh, we had already, we learned uh, some lessons and we were able to implement uh, a, a selected modality uh, within a, a short space of time. Um, the prioritization of our scope e-vouchers, the, the WFP uh, platform uh, also was uh, uh, of great assistance in that uh, as uh, we're able to quickly uh, invoke as it was a, a WFP platform and uh, with the impulse uh, devices that the country office uh, purchased, we're able to implement the, the scope uh, e-vouchers where the retailers will be uh, equipped with um, the impulse uh, devices for the duration of the, of the program and the constant engagement with the retailers uh, ensured that uh, the, pro the pro program uh, would progress um smoothly with them um, some challenges of course and i think also uh with the lesson that we learned was that uh, it was important to engage with the wfp at a higher level whereby uh our the country director would meet with government stakeholders and brief them of what we are doing and this then made the uh, um this is made it uh, it easy for us to facilitate the 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 the, the the requirements of the US dollars that we needed or the cash that we needed for, for the distribution. Uh, also key, uh, what we learned was that uh, the engagement with the banking sector was uh, also a, a key factor for consideration in that um, we, the banking sector will be aware, for example, of what we are doing and to this effect um, would provide them with the statistics or the requirements of the cash that would require to allow them to mobilize the cash uh, in good time. Uh, and with that also, I think uh, when there were policy changes will then uh, allow uh, engage with the banking sector, select maybe some banking sector to come and make uh, presentations within the national cash working group where they would interpret the, the policies that uh, the government would have um, introduced and this uh, assisted uh, in, a, in, in us getting a, a deeper understanding of uh, the economic environment uh, at large. Uh, also, 
uh, I think the, the other lesson was that um, with that, uh, it became apparent that uh, with the, the, our economy was very volatile and we could find the stability in the use of uh, US dollars. Hence the decision to also implement remittance based modality whereby beneficiaries would get real US dollars and then they would have value for, for money in terms of the basket that they, uh, they purchase. Um, so the solution for, for the US dollar uh, was um, of great importance for the, for the country office. And uh, this is uh, highly favored by the, the beneficiaries as they are able to get uh, a real value uh, from the US dollar. dollar. Uh, with the COVID era, the government uh, reintroduced the use of um, US dollars and this made it even easier for us to implement the, um, the, 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 remit the remittance-based um, um, remittance uh, as a modality. So yeah, these are some of the lessons and the challenges that we faced as a country office. Um, I must say that uh, for us, we've also learned that um, our economic environment is volatile. So we, we stand uh, with our contracts in place so that we are able to shift from one modality to the other, if it's mobile money to CIT to remittance based depending on the location of the, of the area where we are implementing the, the program. Uh, with that, I thank you. Over to you, uh, moderator. Thank you so much, Namta and colleagues from WFP Zimbabwe. Um, so it's now my pleasure to hand over to Faye Kagahastian, who is with CashCap and is going to talk to us about the Syria context. So over to you, Faye. Great, thanks, Corey. Um, I got straight to the Northwest Syria context. I just wanted to clarify that I'm not representing the whole of Syria response here. We have three distinct response hubs in Syria, and they're effectively three different countries. So, for the purposes of this discussion, I'll I'll, I'll focus more on the Northwest Syria context. Um, we, we have, as many of you know, um, a, a country that's under international sanctions. What that means is the, you know, we're heavily reliant on imported goods from neighboring countries like Turkey, Iraq, and Lebanon, um, where, um, you know, where most of the humanitarian goods that are transshipped into Syria come from. Um, in particularly in, in Northwest Syria, it's coming mostly from Turkey. Um, our CVA response is NGO-led um, uh, and, and uh, uh, it's, however, I just wanna clarify that it's not scaled up as in many countries. Um, it's still primarily um, an in, you know, uh, dominated by in-kind uh, assistance through the UN Security Council resolution that allows for cross-border transshipment of goods into from Turkey into Northwest Syria. Um, but one, one of the enabling factors for, for, for us in, in, in order that, that allowed us to, to, to address some of the liquidity challenges we've been experiencing for the past several years is um, a, a mature cash working group, which has been operational since 2014. Um, we have partners in the group that are quite well versed in implementing through local NGOs and in managing, uh, you know, CBA programming remotely. On the liquidity challenge, I'll, I'll, again, I'll focus it um, on, on the consistent incremental devaluation of SYP, which we've been seeing um, over the past several years. Um, uh, but I want to frame this liquidity challenge from the perspective of uh, displaced populations receiving the cash. And, and as well as the, the uh, I mean, the displaced population losing, you know, the purchasing power, as well as the traders um, that are effectively losing value on the imported goods uh, that they bought from wholesalers in USD. And, and are selling in the markets uh, in SYP, um, which, uh, which, um, which has caused some of our liquidity uh, challenges. Um, 
what are the lessons we've learned? Um, on to the next slide, please. I forgot the, the prompt. Um, we, I, I wanna focus our solution on the collective actions we've taken as a cash working group. Um, since it's a mature cash working group, we were able to leverage our, our focus on markets to advocate for a um, uniform switch to USD in delivering CBA. Um, and we've had um, collective uh, outputs as well. Um, you know, it, um, this, this didn't happen overnight. So we're talking about a, a few years here uh, of high level proactive consultations uh, across the humanitarian um, community. Uh, and that includes donors. Um, Apart from those consultations, we also um, successfully uh, conducted, this is actually a joint cash cap, uh, cap uh, initiative where we conducted a risk management um, workshop uh, that included um, our different stakeholders, included donors where we unpacked some of the, the, the our perceptions, our different perceptions of risk and a diversion and hawalas and uh, and uh, you know the transfer risks um, to to local uh, NGOs. Um, that really really was uh, an eye opener for all of us, and that um, led to us being able to switch collectively into USD from SYP. And we were also able to um, you know take these discussions to to the different. Um, stakeholders to the humanitarian coordination architecture to the different sectors. We had a one page uh, cash, uh, cash working group um, advocacy note justifying a USD delivery with a very simple key messages. Um, we've also harmonized um, our MPC unit costs for budget proposals. So what that does is we, we, uh, in, we have, uh, we added 20% of the MPC value, um, uh, you know, and, and cal calculated the, the, the unit cost of MPC for, for our budget proposals that way to give us a buffer. So when, um, and of course this is consulted with donors and, and appreciated by donors as well. And we send this out every year before, during uh, proposal uh, season. Um, which is around now, uh, we update it and then send it out, out to donors. But what that, that, what that, what this does is that it gives us that buffer. So if, if within uh, the uh, fiscal year, we have to increase the, the value of the multi purpose cash, we, will, we, we were able to do that uh, with that buffer without going through um, uh, onerous uh, project modification process. Um, what are the lessons learned? So I just have three points here. Um, co coordination is not a dirty word. And what I mean by that is you may be in context right now where there's a lot of politics, a lot of jockeying for positions, uh, you know, for, for, for visibility, et cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, this we, we can't just make, you know, a significant decision as an individual organization. Um, so, so you know, uh, just to keep in mind, also for 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 countries like Afghanistan and Myanmar, who are um, you know reviewing uh, lessons learned from from different countries from Syria, the the proactive coordination is it's such it's such a key thing and. You know that's that's also my second point, which is don't underestimate the ad advocacy role of cash working groups. And then lastly, I think uh, we I, I, again it's it's so important to engage your donors on risk management proactively. Um, it's it's a no brainer all of these things, but you'd be surprised how this gets overlooked. And with that, I yield to Corey. Thank you. Thanks so much, Faye, um, and some really interesting lessons learned there that I hope we can pick up in the discussion. Uh, so handing over to George Bette um, to share some on the Afghanistan context. George, over to you.
George, you're muted. Still muted. Double muted after waking two years. This COVID, <laughs> there we go. Imagine like uh, working remotely. Anyway, uh, so I was saying thank you so much, Corey, for this time and uh, greetings to everyone. My work has been made a little bit easier by Molly and uh, Nomta from Zimbabwe, and uh, also my colleague from Syria here, because the issues which they raised, I am going to touch on those uh, very, very soon. Uh, so next slide, uh, please. Now you might be aware of the situation which is prevailing in Afghanistan. Uh, maybe I can give you a bit of a background so that I can contextualize the liquidity and the cash withdrawal issues which we are facing in Afghanistan at the moment. The four of the previous government in uh, Afghanistan somehow changed the humanitarian landscape on two things. On one hand, we hear from our partners that humanitarian access has actually improved because uh, the de facto authorities, which are the admin at the moment, uh, have control of uh, nearly all the provinces, I think, except one, meaning security has actually uh, in, in improved. Uh, and it also means that access to target populations whose needs are diverse uh, and also varied is no longer really a big challenge. On the other hand, I think you are aware that uh, immediately after the fall of Kabul on the 15th of August, there were uh, international restrictions which were put on the uh, de facto authorities who are running the uh, Afghanistan at the moment. That had an implication in terms of funds flow uh, from international platform, the movement of money uh, at uh, international level, meaning that uh, the uh, flow of funds into Afghanistan is a bit uh, restricted. Actually, it is restricted. And it had uh, an impact similar to what uh, I think that's uh, Nomta and Molly mentioned related to Zimbabwe. The issue to do with non-functioning banks, they have got limited functionality. You will realize that uh, prior to the August 15 events, you would move into an Afghanistan bank and withdraw US dollars from the counter. You would also withdraw some uh, sufficient amount of money uh, in Afghani uh, currents. The currency in Afghani is known as Afghani with an I. You could go and withdraw as any amount which you would require. But as it stands now, US dollars is nearly zero because it's no longer available uh, in the banks. It reminds me of the situation here uh, in, in Zimbabwe. If you go in the Afghan bank, uh, you can as well not really withdraw the amount of cash which you require. It is now 20,000 Afghani per week per individual, which is equivalent to something like $20. And so it is like a crisis, which is similar to uh, exactly what my Syrian colleague mentioned, the issue to do with cash liquidity and uh, cash withdrawal challenges. Within all this, I mentioned that humanitarian access has kind of improved, meaning that we do have access to those who are as well in deep field locations. And we have seen our CVA actors willing to continue and scale up cash responses. So how are they doing it uh, in this uh, liquid uh, constrained environment? Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> now the current state in terms of financial service providers and humanitarian operations is such that we have seen the uh, rise as of now uh, of Hawala networks. What are Hawala networks to those maybe who are interacting with this uh, term for the first time? These are just like money transfer companies which are informal. They are not exactly like banks in that banks are formal, but Hawala networks are informal. Being informal does not mean that they are operating illegally, they are regulated. Like in Afghanistan, prior to the fall uh, of Kabul, they were regulated by the central bank. And they've been in existence in Afghanistan for quite some time. However, agencies were not really relying that much on the awalas prior to the fall of Kabul. But now we are seeing uh, some agencies relying more and more on the awalas. 
but we are asking our, our, ourselves, is this going to be sustainable? In the current situation, again, we are seeing that uh, most financial service providers, not only the Hawalas, they do have numerous contracts with several agencies, three, four, maybe five uh, contracts to transmit money within uh, Afghanistan and sometimes to bring money into Afghanistan. Uh, these FSAPs are managing high case loads and extensive needs because the pressure is now mounting uh, as our humanitarian actors are attempting to increase uh, their activities. It also means we are putting pressure on the financial service providers. Then uh, within this uh, operating environment, we are beginning to see financial service providers raising their uh, transaction fees. For instance, the Hawalas prior to the fall uh, of Kabul, uh, the minimum uh, transaction cost was 2.5%, but now I think as of yesterday, it's at 4% and up to 10%. Then digital financial system. Uh, my colleagues in Zimbabwe were talking how uh, mobile money uh, networks, uh, especially e-wallets are used in humanitarian activity. We are not really seeing that happening in Afghanistan as of now because uh, mobile money uh, is reliant also you know, on cash withdrawals, like cash outs. The use of e-wallets is still evolving and it's, it's very slow. Then Hawalas, in all these Hawalas are like, currently they are a bit resilient. When we spoke with our partners, they said uh, Hawalas are saying they lost 30% of their capacity to deliver if we compare to the period prior to the total takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban. Next slide, please. Now, uh, in all this, we are also seeing like banks beginning to offer uh, some new products and solutions, which we think might aid uh, in supporting our humanitarian activities. For instance, I am told that Aziz uh, Bank is offering uh, something like a credit card, which can be used for electronic vouchers, particularly in urban areas. But we still have like a challenge how can we penetrate deep locations with formal financial service providers? So in all this for now, the Hawalas are really uh, you know, uh, resilient. Now, what are the current concerns surrounding money transfer in Afghanistan? I think as you can see on the slide there, uh, the ability of humanitarian organizations to really have like straight line bank to bank transfers has been hindered. We are also beginning to see, I think my colleague in Syria spoke about coordination amongst uh, humanitarian actors. This is uh, a bit, uh, we are trying to really revive it and make it strong, particularly issues around uh, standardizing uh, commission rates. Uh, next slide, please. And what are the questions which we have uh, at the moment uh, within this current operating environment? We are asking ourselves, are financial service providers going to handle the pressure on liquidity and uh, the issues to do with that? We're not going to see financial service providers prioritizing distributions of certain aid agencies related to cash and voucher assistance, something like what happened in Syria between 2017 and 2018, where uh, it is alleged like uh, Awalas would determine who gets the money, where would the money go and uh, at what uh, uh, commission rate. Uh, so these issues are actually uh, within our minds and we are watching uh, these issues which are on the slide there. And the issues to do with the legality of Awala operations. Since, like I said, the central bank is now in the hands of the Taliban, some of the individuals there are sanctioned. So how are we going to do with issues of due diligence? Uh, I think the last slide, next slide, please. Uh -huh. And in all this, as the Cash and Voucher Working Group, what are we doing to address the, the situation? We have set up uh, a task force, which we are calling a Hawala Procurement Task Force, comprised of uh, UN and INGO partners. And uh, these ones are finance and supply chain colleagues 
we have mandated them to look into the issues, these challenges, and then come up with solutions, uh, which we think will be able to address some of the issues which are on the ground. We are also developing minimum guidance on how we can contact our business uh, with the, the awalas. And uh, uh, lastly, issues to do with the collective bargaining. Our Hawala task force is looking into uh, this issue to really say, how can we do collective procurement of financial service providers within Afghanistan? But as I conclude, we also have a question to say, what will the ban on foreign currents, which was recently announced by the de facto authorities mean on humanitarian activities? And this is something which we are watching as the situation evolves. Thank you so much. Over to you, Corey. Thank you so much, George. Um, and thank you so much for such a thorough presentation being relatively new in the country as well. Um, and finally, we're handing over to Izzy, um, who is the global thematic expert on cash and basic needs from ECHO um, and is talking on behalf of the Donor Cash Forum. So Isabel, um, over to you to bring us home. Hi, can you all hear me and see me? Yes, we can. Great, excellent. Um, well, thanks very much to, to colleagues from Zimbabwe, Syria and Afghanistan for all the insights they've shared so far. Um, and certainly as has already been highlighted by, by all of you, um, as donors, we really see the analysis of such contexts as a, as a collaborative effort, and um, and therefore it's really important for us to be engaged, you know, from the beginning in identifying what the issues are and what kind of solutions can be um, can be arrived at together. So, um, my angle on this really is going to be to to highlight some work that we've been uh, leading as the Donor Cash Forum, and then uh, producing in collaboration with Calp which is to develop uh, what we've called a good practice review on cash assistance in contexts of high inflation and depreciation. Um, whilst inflation and depreciation were the entry point rather than liquidity challenges per se, these are clearly often intrinsically interlinked um, and we see the, the analysis and programming options um, as comparable. And so that's why um, we thought that it would be relevant to present this. Um, and then, uh, so I'll, I'll do that. And then I'll um, uh, share a few reflections on the role of donors um, in liquidity crises. Um, so we can we can move straight on to the next slide. Um, so yeah, I just um, first wanted to, to highlight, um, I guess, why for donors this is an important issue and why as the Donor Cash Forum, we've specifically decided to focus on it um, this year. So clearly donors have a role in ensuring the optimal use of funds to meet humanitarian outcomes and in driving coherence and value for money um, within humanitarian responses. Um, and we, much like all of us, we're very aware of the growing challenge of inflation, depreciation and liquidity uh, in contexts um, in which cash assistance is being implemented. Um, and clearly, as has already been highlighted by colleagues, this requires programmatic flexibility on the part of implementers and donors too. Um, but it also comes with um, uh, sizable considerations in terms of compliance and um, regulatory challenges. So what can the good practice review help um, with in such context and how, how can it support analysis and program adaptation? So what it does, and you can see a kind of um, visual representation of it on this slide, is that it provides a step-by-step -step guide um, uh, based on a compilation of recent experiences, including Zimbabwe and Syria, um, for analyzing and responding to such situations. And I think in a, in a live context like Afghanistan, it can be highly relevant. And we were lucky to have George's counterpart, uh, Mulu, on a recent webinar where we um, presented this guidance. Um, so I, for those of you who aren't familiar with it yet, I really recommend you familiarize yourselves with it and also with the, the detailed case studies from uh, Zimbabwe, South Sudan, Lebanon and Yemen, which accompanied us because um, there's, yeah, I think relevant learning uh, across all of those. So. So that it's kind of familiar for those of us who are used to um, thinking from a program cycle perspective, um, the good practice review uses the key headings of situation analysis, <clears throat> response analysis and response options. So what I thought I'd do is go through each heading and highlight some of the specific considerations around, well, summarize what it does and then highlight some of the specific considerations around liquidity. Um, 
so what the situation analysis section does is it really summarizes what you need to know about the context um, when you're facing such challenges. Um, and so there are there are three steps, contextual analysis, preparatory actions, and programmatic analysis. And many of those have kind of been, I guess, touched on by some of your, um, your presentations so far. Um, so just related to liquidity, some of the kind of um, questions that we encourage users to ask um, as part of this, this situation analysis um, process is what are the possible liquidity constraints um, at national and local level um, in the local currency and or in the hard currency um, as a result of inflation and depreciation or other factors? Um, how is the government responding and what impact could this have on, on prices, um, on purchasing power, on withdrawal limits and, and on liquidity? Um, what could be certain triggers in terms of liquidity and or other factors um, which could prompt a shift in modality or in mechanism? Um, and then what is the availability or not of, of required denominations which correspond to the transfer value, whether that's in local or hard currency? And certainly we've heard of multiple examples where there's been a shift to US dollars, but then the, the value um, has been, let's say, $11.50 or something like that. And uh, from a denomination point of view, that's quite challenging. So then the response analysis, what that does is it um, summarizes the key information points which um, guide decision making based on all that situation analysis and, and the kind of uh, scenario that you're dealing with. So I, I won't read through them, but you can see what the headlines are there. Uh, so in that kind of middle column. Um, and so uh, related to liquidity, the kinds of questions um, that we see the response analysis uh, phase uh, step uh, answering are things like um, which options are possible within the regulatory and governance environment, particularly relating to use of currency or use of different digital solutions. Do digital solutions exist to mitigate liquidity challenges? How well prepared are agencies to shift modalities? And I think you all emphasize that the importance of that flexibility, but we all know that that needs to come with quite a lot of operational preparedness. Um, and then the, finally, the response options stages is the outcome of the response analysis. Um, and uh, so you can see we've summarized a number of options there, many of which have been touched on by, by the speakers so far. Um, and yeah, they include uh, advocacy policy and influencing. Um, and that could relate to addressing some liquidity challenges specifically for the purposes of humanitarian assistance, for example. Um, and then programming options. And just to highlight a few um, kind of elements of specific relevance to liquidity. So it could be things, I mean, iris, you know, when, when, when you're talking about, um, for example, uh, what, 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 if, you're, if you're sticking with cash, let's say, even if it's in a hard currency, thinking about you know, ensuring timely replenishment of ATMs to mitigate liquidity shortages. Um, uh, then there's, you know, as, as you can see in those options as well, the option of shifting from, from cash to value or commodity vouchers, um, often through digital mechanisms. Um, and uh, I just want to highlight as well some of the kind of complementary options, which is really, um, again, has been touched on, uh, for example, by George, um, in relation to Afghanistan. So what can be done in relation to negotiating with FSPs, particularly collaboratively, um, also considering digital currencies. So there's lots of options in there. As I say, it's not, doesn't take liquidity as an entry point, but I think it's highly relevant. And what I was thinking is that hearing you speak is um, that we should, you know, the idea is for this to be a live document and so to be updated with um, the experiences that you're all sharing. Um, so now just a couple of reflections on the role of donors. So um, uh, firstly, you know, it, and I think you've, you've all touched on it, but it's important to recognize the possible uh, policy and regulatory constraints donors are under in such contexts, um, particularly in relation to anti-money laundering and, and countering the financing of terrorism and what that means for donor requirements and expectations. So, you know, it makes it all the more important to have an adequate risk analysis that really looks at um, the impact of, let's say, uh, financial and banking can collapse on um, on the feasibility of transferring cash um, and what kind of contingencies can be developed and really emphasizing you know, to, to, to pick up on phase point in particular the fact that it needs to be a, a collaborative collaborative process and that 
coordination isn't um, a dirty word. And so, uh, you know, really appreciate what's been done in, in Northwest Syria so far. And, and as I understand, is underway in, in Myanmar um, to look at the, the feasibility of working through um, Hundi services. Um, and you know, where, where formal financial institutions have adopted de-risking practices and, and working through informal money operators is, is a solution, this can be considered on a on a case by case basis, but it really needs to be on the basis of that rigorous multi stakeholder risk analysis. Um, based on the experiences that we collected in that good practice review, um, it's clear that donors can also play a leadership role um, in collective advocacy on addressing liquidity constraints. So, for example, on withdrawing you know, large sums to facilitate um, the provision of humanitarian assistance or on regulation enabling the use of, of e-money, for example. Um, I'm nearly there. Uh, and um, I also think donors can encourage the analysis of uh, this issue across the nexus. This really doesn't apply to, to humanitarian programming solely, and that, that's why we like the, the, the angle of this webinar and market-based programming more broadly, you know, looking at how social protection actors and development actors more broadly are dealing with this. Um, but I guess my, my underlying message is that, um, you know, this is a, a collaborative um, or this is a, a, a collective challenge which requires collaborative solutions. And so um, uh, please do, including in the rest of this discussion, share with us your recommendations on how we can play a more coherent role as donors, both in our advocacy um, and our funding capacity. Thanks. Thank you so much to all of the speakers. It's been um, hugely interesting and I think thought provoking as we can see from all the questions. I just wanted to say that as with all of these online events, um, you know, time is always uh, the biggest challenge for us. So we really do encourage you to reach out. As we mentioned, we're gonna be sharing this and to continue the discussions on the Markets and Crisis D group. Um, what I'd like to do now is encourage the speakers to um, uh, turn on their cameras and then maybe talk a little bit about some of the, the key themes that we see coming out of these presentations. We have a couple of other practitioners also who have been given um, speaking capacity on this webinar who didn't have a chance to present, but that are representing perspectives from Yemen and Myanmar. So just please introduce yourself if you want to answer. And my first question, I will direct it, Isabel. Um, always nice to put the donors on the spot. And it's around the ideas of risk and using informal mechanisms, which have been touched on and that you also mentioned. Um, because when it comes to ensuring this liquidity for operational costs and programs as well, there's always this risk of loss or diversion of aid or in, in very serious cases, a violation of financial regulations. And turning to informal mechanisms is something that um, different actors have different comfort levels with um, and different donors have different requirements around. So just kind of as a provocative question on that, who should be taking on the risk or, or perhaps what should we be thinking about when we are um, programming for that type of risk when it comes to ensuring liquidity, but dealing in these volatile um, contexts? Thanks, Louisa, for that question. Um, so I think firstly, I mean, and looking at this from the market-based programming perspective, rather than looking at this, um, looking at this, you know, comprehensively in terms of you know how to manage humanitarian operations, um, I think there's there's always that intrinsic bias towards uh, market-based programming um, as opposed to um, other forms of, of say in-kind assistance in particular, thinking that it is it is more risky per se. So I think firstly, and I know that CALP historically has done quite a bit of work on, on this in, um, uh, and, and others on uh, risks of cash assistance in different contexts. So the analysis needs to be very objective, looking at, okay, what are we looking at in terms of specific risks that relate to cash, and, let's say market-based programming, and ones that are more broadly contextual. Um, I think the, I'm not going to give you a highly satisfactory clear answer on this, um, but I think the type of, um, uh, it, the, the imperative to deliver assistance in such contexts is one that donors and implementers alike share. Um, I think that where we've seen solutions, albeit I'm sure Faye would say not, not fully satisfactory, but we have seen progress in some contexts is because of that shared analysis and the acceptance of a level of risks that may not be fully documented, that may not be, you know, always um, uh, yeah, explicit, but that is based on, on, a, on a common understanding. Um, and so I know that in certain contexts, it may be frustrating to feel like donors aren't you know, as flexible as, as um, 
maybe hoped for the purposes of meeting humanitarian needs. But I, but I truly believe that 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 collective analysis that involves multiple donors uh, working together as well is is really important. And I think we know that there's a need to reinforce donor coordination in that regard as well. And that's something we're we're keen to um, encourage. Great, thanks. Um, and thanks for letting me put you on the spot. Uh, there are a few questions about specifically the role of donors, if you have a chance to look at the Q&A. I'd like to invite any of the panelists or some of the other practitioners that have joined us, um, maybe just to reflect on how you've been approaching this issue of informal mechanisms um, and how you're dealing with these questions of risk, who takes on that risk. And maybe I'll pick on you, Faye, um, considering that there's been a lot of implementation through um, local partnerships, um, and there's been a lot of discussions about how then there's a lot of risk transfer um, and what that means for, for these types of programs. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Luisa. That's exactly what I was going to highlight in, in, in the North uh, West Syria context. It is an acceptable, valid strategy, a risk management strategy to pass on the, the, the risks to, to local organizations. I mean, we are unable to be inside Syria. So, um, you know, our, our context has always been remote management. And, I, in, in, you know, it may be frustrating to some, but over the years of being in this response, I've actually appreciated how we have strengthened local capacity. Um, and, and yeah, in and, and the risk management workshop we, we, we had with donors and with all the stakeholders, we had separate days with, with local Syrian NGOs as well, exclusively to really get them to speak uh, freely about the, the risks that are passed on to them. And we learned a lot from that. Uh, but yeah, just to say that risk management, um, you know, passing it on to, to, to local organizations and implementing partners is, is in itself a risk strategy. Thanks for that. And we're joined by two colleagues, um, Rabia Ahmed from the Cash Markets Working Group in Yemen and Thomas Burns, who had also been supporting in Yemen. We didn't have a chance, unfortunately, to go through all the different um, contexts where this is relevant. Uh, and of course, we're not looking to have all the answers of these complex issues. But if there's anything you'd like to share on the kind of risk and informal mechanisms question, uh, please go ahead. Hi, uh, yes. And thank you all for allowing me this time to speak. Uh, we've been working on Yemen for a number of years with partnership with Rabia, who's leading the cash working group there. Uh, but when talking about risk and talking about informal mechanisms, one of the key elements, and I think it's important to stress, is we often use the word hawala, but hawala just means transfer in Arabic. Uh, and really, we use it as a synonym for unregulated banking. Um, but in Yemen, we have two central banks, which neither of them have actually been able to exercise any regulatory authority or oversight of their own uh, of the banking system for a number of years. Uh, so the challenge here is we have a variety of vendors, we, the, the money exchange actors who used to be, were informal, uh, unregulated, but now play a crucial role in the entirety of the banking system, not just in how humanitarian cash transfers work. Um, so that is a real challenge. How do we, it's not a choice of do we work with Hawalas in Yemen, you have to work with Hawalas, they are but in many ways, it's wrong to say even that the international banks are not really hawalas at this point because there's not any regulatory role being provided there. How we manage it generally is using legacy registrations. Humanitarian actors are generally working with the international, the, the, the commercial banks, who we now we know are then working directly with the hawala networks to to actually enable uh, cash transfers to take place, or even international transfers of money into the country to enable treasury humanitarian banking um but uh, and it, to agree that is uh, that has been built up after discussions with donors discussions with humanitarian country team discussions on who can we interact with who who what secondary levels of um, approval we we have no central bank regulating these international banks but the international banks used to be regulated and they do still have international relations with international commercial banks so we can trust them to a degree but, but that is a, a, always a, a large issue because it is, especially now that we have two central banks issuing contradictory regulatory instructions, uh, is making the situation increasingly challenging. Uh, maybe I'll hand over to Rabia, who's calling in from Sana and probably can give us more details. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. And I do apologize in advance for uh, the 
bad internet connection, but we do have these issues in Sana. Uh, yes, I would definitely second what Tom has mentioned. And apart from all these regulatory issues, there are also on ground issues because uh, the currency notes from one region cannot be used in the other region. And uh, no matter whenever the central banks try to print the new denominations or new currency notes, we are not able uh, to, to use those currency notes across borders because of uh, the certain um, regulations that come out that uh, the banks consider those notes being used cross border as, uh, as a law and order issue. So uh, a lot of times we have these issues and we have to address those issues on ground and we have to limit the, the utilization. So a lot of times we do, do have to do that quite uh, comprehensive monitoring and uh, the partners actually have to go on ground and get all that information in order before they can actually go and implement a cash program in Yemen uh, in, in various different locations. And uh, apart from that, we also have to use various channels to uh, conduct that uh, monitoring so that we can collect the information from various different sources and then we can correlate that information, not only uh, in terms of the exchange rates and the, the, the currency and the regulations themselves, but also from the uh, uh, beneficiary perspective, we have to also see on ground what kind of commodities actually have that major impact of uh, the exchange rate fluctuation on ground and what uh, information we can derive from that particular in, uh, assessment and then hand over to the clusters and to CVA uh, organizations to utilize in their actual programs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and it's always so impressive to see how the collective kind of brain of the humanitarian cash and, and, and markets world um, is able to advance topics on these, on these really, really crucial issues. I'd like to ask John Nelson um, to reflect maybe just briefly on um, what some of these questions around risk, informality, trust, um, huge issues uh, in Myanmar. So we get a bit of a, a perspective from a, from a slightly different context. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm John Nelson. I'm the uh, cash and markets advisor and helping to co-chair the cash working group in Myanmar. Um, yeah, I mean, we're facing all of these same issues in Myanmar. I think, you know, an important thing to consider is that in every context, the legality or how the de facto authorities are dealing with informal money transfer agents or Hundi networks, as we call them, which are the same as Hawalas, is, is very different. And it might even vary between different geographies within the same country and the, the I guess, the reach of the, of the authorities. So um, this is a, these are a lot of questions that we're kind of grappling with in Myanmar and figuring out um, you know, what is that level of risk that partners are willing to, to take on? Because in, in our case, the de facto authorities um, don't want um, money transferring through informal networks. I mean, in the, with the fear that some of these funds will be diverted to um, the civil disobedience movement or other opposition groups. And so, um, it is a risk and, I, and I, it's been very hard to, to, um, to build consensus amongst humanitarian partners on what the best approach is. But it's, it's, um, it's something that um, I think is important to, to look into just the, the differences between um, geographies and contexts. Super, thanks. And actually, that's a great segue into our kind of second question, which we'll go through, unfortunately, with not as much time as we would have liked, but that's just the reality of these situations. Um, and it's around coordination. I mean, Faye, you called it a dirty word. I do think that's quite funny. Um, what has emerged very clearly is this idea of collaboration, of coming together and saying, okay, we don't have answers to all these questions, um, but that we're working on, on, on finding solutions together. I'd like to invite um, Yorgos from CALP just to reflect a little bit on this idea of working alone versus working together and how does that help or hinder tackling some of these liquidity challenges that you've seen in your work um, across the, the region? Hi, Luisa, and uh, congrats for the great event and for managed to continue the conversation around this relevant topic. Um, Carl is working closely, uh, first of all, with the majority of the panelists, <laughs> which are leading cash working groups but also with donors, like the inflation work that we did with the Donor Cash Forum and uh, working closely with Isabel. Um, just to, there is nothing like really uh, new to say, but especially on matters 
relative liquidity, which are fluid and are time bound and affect also they have a very uh, negative impact on, on beneficiaries. Collective action is particularly necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, collective action, for example, uh, in relation to monitoring, uh, to monitoring prices or a continuous adjustment on the minimum expenditure basket or having a common understanding on how FSPs, financial service providers operate formally or informally and then having collective informed decisions so that can be raised to the hierarchy collectively. So that helps a lot in speeding up processes and bringing a common ground that uh, assists and comes to the benefit uh, to the to the benefit of the people who are in need. Uh, there are uh, lots of good examples. We have fair from one example uh, uh, having to deal uh, with a really volatile context and having to do great adjustment adjustments and bring people together. We have Rabia also uh, having to do with another volatile context and bringing up a group of actors to work together collectively. Um, yeah, um, uh, collective action uh, is necessary and all examples and all experiences that we are capitalizing and drawing through our work uh, with the network uh, shows that uh, it can only improve the outcomes or when dealing with liquidity. Yes, Lisa. Great, thank you, Yorgos. Thanks. Um, and now to, to wrap up the discussion before I turn it over to Damien. Um, George, the, the reason we're all here is because of Afghanistan and trying to take, you know, have a fresh look at some of these really complex liquidity issues. What are some of your thoughts around um, that coordination and collaboration aspect that you feel um, either help or, or might you know, create some challenges in terms of addressing liquidity um, in crisis? George, that muted. muted again. Uh, so I was saying coordination is uh, actually key uh, in the sense that we would like to standardize issues to do with the commission uh, rates, for instance. And so, as I mentioned, we are coordinating both from the UN agencies and INGOs to ensure that happens. We also want to have a combined voice when we approach perhaps the de facto authorities in terms of regulating the hawalas, we need a combined voice. And that in itself will entail coordination as well. I hear from uh, Giorgio where he mentioned the MEB value. We are also coordinating in uh, Afghanistan across sectors to ensure that uh, our beneficiaries get effective and uh, useful responses. So coordination, coordination, coordination is the key. Thank you so much. Fantastic, thanks. Now over to you, Damien. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Damien, Damien Jaud, and I work for the Global Food Security Cluster. I'm also the GFSC Focal Point for the Cash and Market Working Group. Um, unfortunately, we don't have too much time to for all the, all the questions we have received. I've seen that a lot of our colleagues have already responded to the question in the, in the chat box, in the Q&A box. Uh, but I want to, to, to start with one question. And it's, it's about the involvement of the, the, the beneficiaries. Uh, how do you, because we, we have talked a lot about donors, about, about organization and so on, but we haven't talked too much about, about the beneficiaries, the recipients. So how do you make sure that they are part of the, of the discussion? How to make sure that they are involved in the process? Um, so I don't know if, if, if there's one uh, panelist interested to respond to that question. I'm happy to, I'm probably, you're probably all thinking, gosh, she must be the furthest away from the beneficiaries, so what's she talking about? But, um, but uh, I just would like to touch on how we've tackled this in the, in the good practice review, because I think we've tried to be quite systematic about it. So um, at every um, step, we, when we're looking at the, the situation analysis and the response analysis that I mentioned, then we look at uh, who needs to be involved. Um, we try and highlight how to involve the beneficiaries at each stage in terms of understanding, you know, 
uh, how they are going about, for example, addressing liquidity constraints and how you can build on that and what their experiences are in previous crises and, and things like that. Um, and then uh, with the, the response options, each one starts with what are the implications for the beneficiaries, including the risks that may need to be monitored. Um, I'm thinking particularly around you know, dollarization, um, uh, for example, but, but um, that's something where there's a whole new set of risks that we're potentially exposing beneficiaries to. And so what's the implications for um, assessing those together with them? Um, and finally, the last bit that also does that is on preferences, when we really use that as it's the first thing in the um, uh, in the response analysis process, because it has to be guided by that. That's the theory, but over to others for the practice. Thanks, Elatizi. Is there someone else that from, the, from the panelist that is more maybe more closer to beneficiaries that want to say something, to add something? Anybody? Yeah, um, for Yemen, yes, what we did was, okay, please let me know if you cannot hear me. For Yemen, what we did was that uh, there were some uh, discussions uh, within the cash working group and also some suggestions from the various key actors that um, the US dollars can be distributed to the beneficiaries. But what we did was we actually um, uh, got uh, the field teams various uh, CV organizations to look into the fact that whether we should actually distribute US dollars to the beneficiaries or not, and what would be uh, the concern from the beneficiary perspective. So for Yemen, we actually got into very detailed conversations and then we released a proper guidance on utilization of uh, foreign currency to determine the uh, assistance packages. And as part of that uh, guidance note, we did consider all those concerns uh, related to the beneficiaries to the humanitarian community and to everyone, how that impacts all layers uh, uh, how and how all of these layers are interconnected and associated to each other. So for us, we actually took into consideration even the protection concerns which beneficiaries might have while converting the US dollars in um, the market, whether they feel safe about it or not. So all of these parts were considered for, uh, for Yemen and we do plan to do that consultation directly or indirectly, whether it's through the anecdotal evidence or we have to go on ground and get that information from the beneficiaries themselves. Currently, what we are doing is we are in consultation um, and we have some on ground teams uh, through reach and we are collecting information from the beneficiaries uh, or from the households themselves uh, to identify their consumption pattern so that we can inform the lump sum packages as part of the SMAB revision process. So we do take that into consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's because of the time, we can only answer one question. So th thanks a lot for, for answering this question. Um, we have received a lot, much more, well, a lot of questions on what we'll do at our level is that we'll, uh, we'll compile all of them on the, um, and we'll uh, send the compilation of question and response with the presentation on the recording. Um, so that will be all for, for today. So th thanks a lot for all the participants. And I can see that we, we reach a lot of people uh, about, uh, I think 400 people registered. And we had today about uh, over 100, and, well, close to 130 people who, who joined this webinar. So thanks a lot for, for you who joined this webinar. And thanks also all to all the panelists on the presenter. That was very useful. I think there was a lot of positive feedback that we received on the chat box. So thanks a lot. Uh, on, I can see there's a lot of appetite, a lot of interest in this discussion, or maybe we can uh, organize follow-up webinar or discussion on that topic. So thank you. Have a good day, and uh, hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.